Hello everyone, welcome to the Sustainable Fashion Podcast, the place where McGill students seek to learn more about the growing and exciting industry of, you guessed it, sustainable fashion. Joining us today is Pai Vilanka, who is a senior manager and textile expert at Fordham Corporation under the Bio2X program. So Fordham is a, a Finnish energy company. And a few years ago, they started a program called Bio2X, whose mission is to, and I quote, produce high value products from agro residues and woody biomass to replace fossil and other environmentally detrimental raw materials. So some of our listeners may already be confused, but that's why we have Pivy here. Pivy, we're very grateful to have the opportunity to speak with you um, and thrilled to have this conversation. So thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for inviting me. I'm, I'm more than happy to be on. So I, I guess before we get into the heart of the ma matter, why don't we clarify what biomass and agro residues are because it's essentially your, the raw materials that you use to make your sustainable fabrics but some people may not even be familiar with these terms all right so if, if very simply explaining what biomass is or agro residues are so when you get to crane you get your cereals or you get your your bread or something so that's made of the of the crane and the residues, the rest of the harvest, uh, what is beside of that, what we get for the food industry is kind of like a residue and ac acrobiomass. And that's the raw material for us. So earlier hand, it's been understood more like as a waste or as a residue completely. But our understanding, that our understanding is that it's a very high value raw material that we can utilize in the future. So if this is a simple way to make it, make it. That's great, thank you. So one of the exciting projects you've been working on is making fabric out of wheat straw. So can you tell us a little bit about how making this fabric differs from making traditional fabrics such as cotton? And I say cotton because if I'm not mistaken, it's the closest substitute for this wheat straw. Is it a more expensive process? To what degree is it less water intensive? Can you tell us about the production of this wheat straw fabric? Okay, so uh, once we start talking about uh, this fiber, so we, we start talking about the cellulosis as, as a, a raw material. And then we come to the same area, like maybe you are more, or we are more familiar with the names of viscose or rayon or lyosol. And this group of materials is called man-made cellulose. So it's kind of like using the cellulose that we get from basically for all the plants. I mean, from the trees or from the grass or in our case, from, uh, from the harvest or from the straws. So this is the raw material used for this fiber. And of course, it differs a bit from, uh, from cotton, for instance, because cotton is harvest because of cotton, because of this uh, textile fiber we get out from that, but this, our uh, material cellulose is uh, taken out from, from some material, like it can be wood or in our case of straw. And what is still the difference, um, for instance, the woody uh, masses that are used for viscose traditionally, or lyosol or rayon in, in many countries is called rayon. So uh, that's very often used so that half of the wood is used for cellulose and the rest is burned for making energy or very often kind of like not utilized. But our uh, kind of like beauty also in this um, uh, Bio2X is that we are using the fractionation technology that we are utilizing 90% out of the straw and having the first waste and then <laughs> utilizing 90% out of that. Uh, we think it's, it's very revolutionary also. And uh, uh, roughly 40 out of this 90 is cellulose uh, used for this textile fiber, but we are also utilizing the hemicellulose and, and lignin that are the composites of uh, every single uh, growing plant or wood or whatever. And those are also used for other um, areas of applications like um, 
but, but not going there. But they are anyhow um, utilized as well beside of the cellulose like we are using for, for textile fiber. And uh, the touch and feel, depending what kind of like fiber technology is close to cotton, but otherwise we are using this, or the raw material is a bit different than in cotton that is completely plant-based. It's completely a natural fiber, but this is man-made out of the cellulose. So that's a simple, <laughs> simple uh, uh, definition for, for this man-made cellulose fiber. So you mentioned, you mentioned viscose as the point of contrast. Um, is it that your fractionation technology is more sophisticated than what has traditionally been used, which means it produces less waste, whereas the technology that for, is used to make viscose, for example, is just half of it is wasted and half is used? Is it? Yeah, because yeah, because uh, in always uh, there are two steps that always first we need cellulosis. It doesn't matter whether it's viscose or whether it's this our fiber. So we first need the cellulose made out of the pulp. And then this pulp, whether it's um, made uh, as we see paper, so we call paper pulp, the quality is like made for paper industry or like the pulp, like being used for viscose production, for instance, called dissolving pulp. So this is the first phase always needed. And then the technology is making the fibers, they vary. So viscose traditional is very polluted. It's very uh, toxic <laughs> uh, kind of like technology, like uh, in production in, in traditionally in China, for instance, that's, that's very heavy for, for environmental, for instance. But nowadays also in viscose production, there are much more advantaged technologies like uh, maybe you know the company called Lensing, which is Austrian based company. And they are producing viscose called Ecovera, for instance, where they have a very closing loop for using the chemicals. So it's not so envi environmental heavy any longer. But we are focusing anyhow to technologies like um, that are the most sustainable, like where either it's not, no uh, chemicals at all or the chemicals are not at, at all toxic or much less uh, water use or much less uh, energy use than in anyhow in viscose technology. And those are couple of them, maybe me talk about them later on, but kind of, kind of like understanding that there are always two phases, like raw material, cellulose is first, and then we can choose different uh, technologies for making the fibers. And, and, and that's, that's, that's good to understand when talking about these uh, man-made cellulose fibers. And so is making this, is making this more sustainable fa fabrics more, a more expensive process? Not necessarily, no, not necessarily. But of course, always when when start making the new fibers, so this takes a lot of testing and a lot of a lot of kind of like time for, um, yeah, for different kind of like lab testing and and of course this is very expensive, honestly saying. But once and when um, this uh, goes to to industrial level kind of like production where the scale upping is. Um, uh, high enough or we have volumes high enough so understanding and and the target is that the fibers we are producing or anybody who is working with these new sustainable fibers don't see that they need to be much more uh, ex much more expensive than current ones not talking about a polyester polyester is another game <laughs> that is very low price but when we talk about cotton or we talk about the the other materials that are more natural based so pricing is not the major case it's more like how we can scale up the production to bigger volumes yes makes sense which is i think it's very good news because it's not it's not necessarily very expensive <laughs> yes 
So since you mentioned scaling, what are the next steps for Fordham and Spinova now that have, they've created this wheat straw fabric? Is it to refine the product? Is it to produce it at scale? Are, are, are you not there yet? What are the current projects? Um, like a bee at Fortum, so we've been, we've been testing our pulp with a couple of different techno, uh, technology provider. And you mentioned one named Spinova. And Spinova has been, we've been partnering with them and we continue to collaboration, but we've been also partnering with a company called Infinity Fiber Company. And we've been testing also with Lyocell technology. So there are different technologies uh, that are possible to be connected with our pulp. And uh, the first step is to get the pulp, the cellulosis to the level that can match best way with the chosen fiber technology. And at, at the moment, the best uh, maybe quality of products we, we receive through using the Infinity Fiber Companies uh, technology. But we are, like I said, we are, we are continuing also testing with Spinova. But uh, to your question where we are right now, so um, the major step is to um, uh, get the cellulosis right and then get the bio refinery because we need first kind of like the bio refinery to get the cellulosis out before we can go to fiber making and that make that 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 will take a little bit time because those plants are huge we talk about um, three, 300 kilotons of material and you can imagine this is this is quite a lot of, of uh, material that will be in the production. So we are, we are, we are testing now and uh, scaling up will happen within coming years time. So you, you mentioned infinite, infinite fiber company. This is something mm -hmm. that I was unclear about when I was reading the articles because the company essentially recycles uh, no, it manufactures cotton-like fiber for the textile industry from recycled fiber and cellulose. But when you say cotton-like and recycled fiber, what kind of fiber are you talking about exactly? And how is this technology different from the one Spinova is, is making? Because you said that it needs to fit your own technology. Can you clarify that? Right, so uh, Infinite Fiber Company can, can benefit every single material that consists cellulosis, even recycled paper. So there are, there are a lot of uh, different um, uh, possibilities for, for Infinity uh, Fiber Company as well, as for uh, raw materials. And then you're asking the differences between Spinova and um, Infinity Fiber Company. So there's a quite quite big difference uh, in technologies because Spinova is um, able to use uh, pulp or cellulosis like in paper industry. So it's kind of like paper paper pulp. It feels, uh, so it, it doesn't need any dissolving. And that's a, that's a major difference in between very many traditional other fiber technologies like Wisco's. And, and they are kind of like, um, how to say that in English? Um, it's quite squeezed, kind of like the, uh, the paper with, uh, with water to very kind of like gel, kind of like, um, uh, it's not liquid, but it's more like gel. It's, it's really like, um, kind of like mass that they, it, it's like gel. And then you uh, squeeze it uh, through its noodles, very thin, very super thin holes and get the fiber out from that. So it's, it's very um, non-toxic, no chemicals, uh, kind of like a technology. The challenge might be that cause it's very um, uh, kind of like, um, 
mechanical process. So how thin and fine fibers you can get out from that. But Spinova is working very much with this, this one to get as fine fibers as possible. But when we jump to the Infinity Fiber Company's uh, technology, so they use a uh, dissolving pulp. So that pulp is dissolved. But what we are using for this uh, dissolving are non-toxic non uh, chemicals. So it's a urea. <laughs> Sounds not so nice, but that's, that's what they are using kind of like for that. And it's non-toxic. And it's kind of like uh, closed in the loop also. So nothing goes to, to environment, etc. So they can, they can circle this urea and this liquid kind of like infinity, like forever kind of like in that sense. So, but that enables to make the fiber much finer and thinner than from this mechanical process. And they are the two differences. And, and uh, the latest uh, tests we have done with the uh, Infinity Fiber Company's technology. So we, we received very, very uh, cotton-like, uh, very soft and, and beautiful materials. So we continue to work with both of them, but touch and feel is a bit different from those materials. Spinovas, uh, I don't know, if maybe you have seen the pictures, the first launches we made in Vancouver like a uh, year and a half ago. So the touch and feel was a little bit like linen. It's it's a bit different. And the latest one we launched like a couple of months ago, um, done the materials with Infinity Fiber Company. So they look and feel more a bit like lyocell or cotton, very, very, a bit different as a material. So there are two differences. Um, in between these two technologies. And do these fabrics that you create have a name, a specific name? Because we always say, oh, they feel like linen, they feel like cotton, but do they have a name of their own? Yeah, the one that Fortune Bio2X is uh, doing the fiber, so we have registered it under the name Bio2Textile. So it's Bio number two textile. And Infinity Fiber Company, they have registered their own uh, fibers that ma they make from recycled cotton, for instance, by name Infinna. Infinna. That's, that's the name of the fiber. And Spinova, actually, they haven't uh, introduced uh, any other name so far than Spinova. So most likely they keep the name Spinova for the, for the fiber. So. Okay, makes sense. And is the dyeing, because you make the fabrics, but then dyeing that fabric, do you touch on that at all or no? Uh, in that sense, definitely that dyeing, for instance, in value chain of textiles is one of the most polluting and the most challenging part. And the less uh, um, colorations, the less water you need, the better it is for, for the chain. And that's what we try to develop and we have seen very good uh, results also with, uh, for instance, with Infinity Fiber Company that it requires much less water and dyes than, uh, for instance, cotton uh, in that sense. So it, it, it will be much more environmental. Uh, friendly in that sense as well than than conventional cotton, for instance. So it's very it's very important part to get this um, coloration and coloring uh, dyeing as uh, low uh, impact uh, as possible. So we spoke about your fractionation technology. Uh, in your website, it says that. It, it leads to a higher purity of fractions when you separate it into its components. It leads mm -hmm. to higher purity of fractions than traditional pulp and biofuel processes. Can you tell us what it means to have higher purity and why does it provide an advantage over traditional pulp? No, like mentioned earlier, so in traditional, if you say traditional pulp uh, industry, so very often it's it's done the way that only the cellulose is taken out from from the uh, from the feedstock, and the rest, lignins and hemicellulose, they they are very seldom even utilized. They are very often just taken uh, as for any energy production. So, honestly, saying burnt, burnt, so far. 
but in with this technology we can really take all those components and fractions from from the raw material and utilize all of them so no need to lose any high value uh, raw materials and resor uh, resources any longer but kind of like use them all for for applications and, and different areas so that's why we are saying that this is much higher value than earlier had been and still currently very very heavily in pop industry so yeah that's that's the reason why we are saying so this reminds me of, of one of the things you're doing as well so Fordham is making multiple biorefineries and one of the things you're doing is you're using bamboo to produce bioethanol that's then mixed with oh. petrol, but it also makes bio coal, which you combine, which you then use to produce heat and power to the biorefinery. Is this something that Fordham is trying to do for all its biorefineries using clean energy to produce clean fabrics? Or are its investments in clean energy currently separate from its investments in clean fabrics? Of course, we are uh, once and when we see where we are going to uh, locate in the future our biorefineries. So we are definitely uh, looking for locations where we can use the clean and renewable energy because that's very kind of like important part out of our story and the, the future of uh, materials as well. This uh, uh, biorefinery in India that what we're currently working with or building that one. So that's the first one we are we are uh, making and, and that's... I'm not so deeply involved in that project and how much we see the future for bioethanol. But uh, of course, this is very much kind of like a re replacing the current um, uh, fossil based um, kind of like uh, petroleums uh, for, for different industries in, in areas like India. So that's one, one kind of like uh, area for applications to use the fractionation technology also. So can you give us an example of how, what sort of clean energy you would use to power a biorefinery? Uh, depending if we, for Central Europe, if we think about, so it can be solar, it, it can be kind of like uh, wind power. So different, different kind of like clean energies. For instance, here in Finland, we are very strong with, uh, with wind power, for instance or going uh, to areas like India or somewhere. So most likely it will be the solar. But all of these new, because we are like, like you introduced Fortune at the beginning of this. So we are very much like energy company uh, in the soul and core of, of this company. And, and we see very strongly where the future of energy uh, production and, and will go. So we know that renewable energy sources will be the future or whether it's it, it's going, going to be the hydrogen in the future, etc. But the, but a lot of a uh, lot of options for renewable energies, depending on a little bit where you are located. So I'm not very familiar with renewable energies. If you use solar or wind power, do you get a stable source of energy? Do you have to deal with fluctuations? How does that affect the production process or how might? Uh, yeah, for time being, like we all know that this is the major challenge like for wind and solar. So that's um, how, how we can keep the stable production. And might be that still we need to use for a couple of years to go kind of like uh, other um, resources based, whether it's um, gas based or whether it's some other sources based energy. But kind of like uh, the um, development goes further all the time and the less and less we need kind of like other sources for for. Um, non-windy or non-sunny days, but for time being, there is still a little bit need for a replacement. But all in all, we try to uh, find the solutions that we, we don't need to use uh, coal paste, for instance, or oil based gas. Of course, we know this is not the optimal either as a solution, but for time being, uh, if some um, kind of like um, other options are needed uh, for for those uh, moments that we don't have the renewables available, so as less environmental heavy as possible. Makes sense. 
So going back to your fractionation technology, it says that it enables decentralized production and smaller, more flexible refineries than before. Why does fractionation technology enable decentralized production and more flexibility? Well, actually, it's it's not that heavy uh, processes that in traditional pulp um, factories or plants, and and like using the straw for uh, for instance, or in our case when we use the straw as a as a feedstock, it doesn't make any sense that the logic logistic distances, for instance, are too long. So it it means that the circle around the plant, wherever it's located, need be reasonable. And we are we are talking about like a max hundred kilometers, kind of like a circle. So that's that that's one reasoning that we try to find the economical uh, functioning uh, um, plants that um, can be smaller in size than traditional uh, pulp uh, plants being for time being and that seems seems to be working very well so we don't we don't need so huge pulp um, pulp plants like uh, traditional the forest industry requires but why is that why is it that the traditional method requires huge production plants whereas it's, it's simply different technology than this fractionation so how this is this is using kind of like formic acid and water so and and the, for instance um, uh, the way of making pulp doesn't require that much energy and heat etc so it, it's possible kind of like um, get the economy of scale from smaller plants than in traditional uh, pulp industries and the plants for that. So it's a different technology and that enables for smaller plant sizes to be economically um, uh, possible. So uh, my next question is that you're, you're testing different forms of raw materials, uh, bamboo, wheat straw, paddy straw, hardwood, uh, are you using all these forms of raw materials because their compositions is similar and so the end result is similar and so it makes it easier to scale? Or, or is there a different reason why you're using so many different ones and not focusing on, on one? Actually, we are focusing. We are focusing into straw and, and currently the wheat straw. Uh, potentially, this technology, the fractionation technology, can utilize all of this mentioned. We like bamboo. Okay, we are using and, and testing and, and going to use bamboo in India, for instance, for this first one. But currently, we are focusing the wheat straw, and 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 we've been testing very um, in small scale rice straw as well. But to your question, also even it sounds like they are same, but they are different. So every everyone out of them out of these mentioned ones require different kind of a bit same technology, but it, uh, it, it requires tweaking things. And when we go to to uh, woody masses, so that's very that's a different as well. So it, it's better to be um, focusing to something. Makes sense. So when, when you say they require different tweaking, but the end result, the end product, is it the same or is it different? Are you looking to have the same texture or is that tweaking not gonna result in the same texture? Um, if we talk about the textile fiber, so uh, um, they might be some differences in touch and feel, but the major difference comes from the chosen fiber technology, like whether it's Spinova or Infinity Fiber or Lyosil, we are not going to use viscose, but if it would be viscose. So that's making the major difference to touch and feel. Uh, raw material as well, most likely if we, if we use any woody masses or even rice or the weed, uh, it will be slight difference, but not that big, huge difference in the touch and feel. Um, and also the, the fiber length is different when we use different uh, raw materials, for instance, like uh, the Nordic woody masses from, from Scandinavian countries, for instance, the fiber length is very, is very long. 
so the quality quality of cellulosis is different. It's it, of course it's better for fiber production than, for instance, rice or wheat, where the fiber length is pretty short. So there they are also the differences depending what what is the raw material, the feedstock that you are using. But basically, like mentioned earlier, so all everything that is screened <laughs> can be utilized. So everything that has some some kind of like uh, cellulosis, it's been questionized that could we could we use even the um, uh, what is that in English? Uh, like the ones uh, that are growing in the seas and lakes. Um, is it just, how, how you call that? Sea grass or, or, or something like. So basically, er everything could be used for this uh, production, but qualities are a little bit different. Interesting. So, in the long run, then, do you think that these new materials will take over traditional ones? Or do you think we'll mainly be using more sustainable versions of current materials? Um, knowing, like you know, most likely also that the scale of fibers used globally, so it's so huge. And, and knowing that 60% out of the current fibers are synthetics, meaning polyesters is the dominator. And knowing that that's been happening within last 40 to 50 years. So uh, unfortunately, I don't see that the chains will be so quick that these new ones will take over to current uh, existing uh, fibers and knowing the population will grow um, very uh, de many developing countries. Um, uh, will have more and more disposable income to utilize. So meaning that the uh, um, need for fibers will increase even faster than population growth will do. So demand for fibers is, is so huge that I think we, we think if I see next 10, 15 years, I see that these new ones can bring very good addition on the top of the current one. And hopefully we can start replacing the current very environmental heavy uh, things like conventional cotton or polyester. But I think it takes a bit more than 10, 15, even 20 years that we can see that they will they would replace the current ones. And of course, this recycling, I mean, we have huge amount of fibers uh, available that we, we could recycle. So I see there a huge potential also that we are we are keeping the current fiber much longer in, in, in the loop and in the circular economy. So not only that we uh, um, put in new fibers, whether they are more sustainable produced or however they are produced, but also like how we are able to keep them longer in the loop. So they might be more the answers to current um, problem than only having the new sustainable fibers. Yes, makes sense. So, so to summarize your point, you see it as the recycling the current materials, so keeping the fabrics longer, then the new materials are going to be coming into the market. And you think that this is mainly in the developed economies, whereas the developing economies are going to take longer to even do recycling and the new materials are even longer. Not, not necessarily. My point was that because the, the need for fibers will increase heavily in the future because uh, in developing countries, people will have more and more um, and it's the same consuming power. So it means that uh, needs for fiber is increasing in many areas that currently are not uh, kind of like uh, consumed, uh, consuming the way that we are consuming here in EU, for instance, or United States or in, in high developed countries. So meaning that fiber need is increasing so heavily that uh, we need to find a ways to, to circle to current ones that we are producing 
I, I don't I don't see that we can have much more um, Arab land for cotton production, for instance. So we need more land for food production, and kind of like then it means that current cotton farming land, for instance. So we need to keep this cotton more longer in in the circular circularity. So meaning that people should wear the clothes longer, kind of recycle them secondhand, whatever they are. But of course, there is someday there is the end for every every single shirt. I mean, you cannot use it forever. But point is that bring it back to the uh, recycled cotton as a material, like Infinity Fiber Company, for instance. So then they are collecting the cotton. I mean, for, uh, the um, materials from the market and not kind of like burning them or doing like currently mainly all the, the textiles are inherited or they are burned or they are not um, collected back and recycled. But if we get these raw materials like from the jeans or shirts that no one is willing to wear any longer back to the recycling and using this recycled cotton as a raw material. So then we don't need the virgin materials all the time, whether it's cotton or whether it's polyester or whether it's these sustainable new materials, but keeping them much longer in the loop. And beside of that, then of course, always needed some virgin material. That's not the point. We, we cannot forever just circle something, but needing less the virgin materials than we are currently doing. Because now in the linear system, like what we are doing, so we are putting them to the loop from one end and drawing them out from the other one. But that's that's impossible to continue like we all know so that's a point but we uh, definitely there is a huge 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 market uh, for sustainable and new materials that we are working with our bio 2x or uh, a lot of other companies are working with uh, different pulp pulp um, from forest or from bamboo or different raw materials but um, we are we are focusing to to residues and and you're right that there is a huge market for it. In fact, other new investors in in for example in Infinite uh, Fiber Company is H and M. So my question is, what is uh, Fordham planning to do with this access to sustainable materials? Is it to work with big brands? Um, yeah, because uh, in the value chain. Our role will be the fiber supplier. We are not a yarn maker. We are not a fabric maker. We are not a fashion house. But um, we can work and we see our future to be working with very different kind of like companies, whether it's H&M or whether they are different areas, because they are also, I see also a lot of new brands and companies coming to the market who are focusing already to using more sustainable materials. So we haven't been saying that we are only working with H&M or we are only working with new companies or we are no, only working with, with some areas, but we only know that we are going to be the fiber supplier and, and then start working and developing things with different kind of like a vendors in, in, in the brand brand area. And also most likely working with the fabric makers who are then working with different brands. So there are, there are many different approaches <laughs> to, to textile and fashion market. And at the same time, we're talking about here wearables and fashion. But uh, we are also very keen on understanding uh, the market for so-called non-wounds. Like um, there are a lot of uh, areas like um, in hygiene or medical textiles or, um, for instance, this pandemic and <laughs> this COVID and the, all the face masks that people have been wearing globally. So they are all made out of the non-woven. So kind of like different different materials needed for those purposes. So, or are they kind of like um, uh, wipes or are they kind of like um, uh, diff different needs for non -wool. So that's one very big sector also. So can you, clear, can you tell us what the main difference is between making non-wovens and wovens, I guess? <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, Nunwu is, is kind of like an Nunwu, so it's, it, um, I'm not very, very professional with that, but they are, uh, they, it doesn't need any yarn or it's not woven or it's not knitted. So it's kind of like pressed kind of like uh, together, like, like we see our face mask. When you take a look out of that, you see it's not woven, it's kind of like melted, it's kind of like pressed together like fibers. And there are different technologies like how they are used, or if, if you see the um, diapers, or if you see something, so all of those materials are called non-wovens. Or when we go, for instance, um, it's quite interesting, we hardly even think about that, but in many areas like construction industry or in, in um, auto, uh, automobile industry or in, in agriculture industry. So there are quite a lot of materials used that are made of fibers or even, even in, um, uh, in interiors, for instance, kind of like wall materials or acoustic kind of like uh, cover plates. Or, so there are huge um, amount of areas where fibers are utilized and that's one application area also that we are we are keen on understanding how we could replace the current quite often for cell based materials they are very often they are based on on polyesters or this kind of like for cell for cell based materials so that's one area yeah and that's really cool because a lot of those non wovens are disposable like diapers and so on exactly. you just use them exactly. and yeah, that's very cool exactly. yeah so, I want to go back to uh, the technologies you were mentioning, the IFC technologies uh, that you say use less chemicals. What sorts of chemicals are used in the production of traditional fibers that are not used in the making of uh, the fibers that are made by Infinite Fiber Company, for instance? Um, oh my goodness, I should remember the names of the, in the viscose they are using um, Oh, what is the name of that? Oh my goodness, I, I don't remember the name of the chemicals, but they are they are very it's it's kind of like ammoniums and, and very heavy chemicals that are used for making the viscose. But like mentioned in IFC technology, they are using urea and nothing else, which is kind of like basically you could put this back to nature and it doesn't harm anything, but kind of in, in traditional viscous technology. So the, the chemicals used are very toxic and they're very heavy for, in, for, for environment, not only for environment, but actually also for people who are working in those production plants. So, so there's, a, there's a very big difference in, in between those uh, things. So moving, moving now to Spinova, they're testing a technology that turns microfiber-related cellulose directly into a fiber without dissolving uh, harmful chemical processes. Is this similar to what you were just speaking about or is it different? Uh, that's a, that's a, in that sense, it's very different still because like, like I briefly mentioned earlier, Han, so basically they are not using almost any chemicals because it's, it's made out of the paper quality cellulose. So they are not dissolving anything. So they hardly need any, any chemicals. And they are just like uh, pressing and squeezing kind of like this paper with, it's, it's just water and they make the gel out of that. So it's, it's completely, we could say chemical free uh, technology. And that's really the beauty of that. So they don't, they don't need any chemicals for production and also the water they need for that so they can recycle that so the and if it's the poor water then it's no harm for anything even but they even keep the water in, in the loop all the time okay makes sense um a lot of uh, i have a question that i, I don't I was not in the list uh, a lot of when we think about uh sustainable and so on not a lot of people dig into the technology and how it works a lot of people see oh 3d printing is sustainable and they, they they're like we're going to be printing clothes what's your opinion on this how what's your opinion on 3d printing and sustainably for clothes the ones that i've seen don't look like fabric don't feel like fabric do you think it's going to take on in the long term 
Sorry, one more time. What was your question? My question is just uh, when we talk about sustainable clothing, one of the things that people like to talk about is printing clothes, like three D printing. Ah, three D. Okay, right. What? Um, uh, honestly, saying uh, I think the digitalization, all in all, where we talk about three uh, uh, D or uh, robotics or something, that's that's very interesting, and, and it's going to be the, the question for the future, really, and and connected to traceability and and um, everything. So they, they are the big questions, and also we we talk about quite quite a lot about kind of like a localization also because now the the value chain is crazily fragmented and and like we know that it's so long and fragmented that hardly anybody understand and know any longer what is happening and how the t-shirt that we see costs like fifteen dollars or ten dollars how it's possible and what's been happening there and, and I think people are more and more really keen on understanding that I want to know. And then we come to this traceability question and then we come uh, to, to tools that uh, today's uh, technology and dig digitalization can pro provide to us. And that only gives us um, possibility to see the, the value chain, what is happening, but also kind of like understand that how we can change the value chain also and and also coming at the same time to understand the robotics um if we could uh, bring more the production closer closer to, uh, to consumers and people and even go more towards like we produce what is needed so that's that's very very interesting and the uh, 3d at the same time that whether we can go there and really kind of like use much less material if we can really make the 3D because then it's no waste from the material if we can if we can see the production in the future to be more like it's it's only only all the material are used for you for your garment that it's produced by 3D. Um, whether 3D is in the near future most likely maybe not but it will be in one day, but all those tools that are already currently available, I think all together can bring us towards much more sustainable value chain of, of textile um, industry all in all. And one more time has less, less waste and longer uh, like a life cycle for every single garment that we have there. And, and at the same time, I see kind of like educate people to understand that how you can value uh, how, how, how you value your garments because I, I think we are we have changed our um, habits for uh, using things more to fund than appreciate the garments that we are buying so it's it's more like it's more like same like I, I buy kind of Coke than I buy new T-shirts. So it's kind of like no appreciation any longer for, mm -hmm. for the garment because they are so low priced. But going more towards that we value the materials and the workmanship and the design and the beauty of them and, and maybe um, <laughs> buy not so often, but kind of like when once we buy, we, we really buy something that we want to use and wear longer and appreciate the beauty of them. So I think that's something that we, we move towards and, and seeing the younger generations already quite a lot, at least here in, in, in the wealthy countries, uh, thinking that... Um, Enough is enough. We don't. We, we don't. We don't have to buy new things every week. But we, we can. We can change our habits also. But to your question, I, I see digitalization can provide a lot of lot of um, new things. Uh, it was quite an interesting discussion once. Uh, once and when we've been living this um, remote work culture now for one one and a half years already. That how much people 
any longer need new clothes or can they be kind of like digital clothes? Can you wear your coaches for team meetings? for 50 dollars $50 a week kind of like and not investing five thousand for your coaches in that sense so that's quite interesting and thinking also like how much we really need to own something or can can it can it be in some some cases also be a completely new way of um, utilizing the, uh, the beautiful design and beautiful things that people are providing so a lot of a lot of interesting things there but this traceability is something that yeah, I think it's it's one of the key questions for the future. Yes, very true. And you mentioned that last point of uh, virtual clothes. When I saw mm. that, I, I didn't know if I liked it. I like to own things physically. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's just yeah, like maybe, maybe of course. I I, I don't th I don't think it will be the major way of doing. But in some cases, maybe not always needing new things. Of course. Um, Nothing against that having and owning things, but I don't think we need to own everything that we, we see and like. So, yes, I, I want to thank you so much. We learned a lot. It was very interesting, uh, fascinating stuff. And thanks, uh, it was very nice. We had a really good time talking to you. We would love to have you back at some point in the future to discuss the developments if if uh, you're interested. Um, oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah, I'm more than happy to come and tell once once we have some a little bit more. And I assume you have you have seen the pictures of our uh, collab with one designer of Ecrut, for yeah. instance. So, yeah, good. So you know what what kind of things we have done so far. So when we have next next kind of like uh, news, so I'm more than happy to share it with you. Yes, I'll cer certainly stay up to date. So thank you yep. so much for joining us and I uh, hope to see Thanks, you. Well. Yeah, thank yeah. you very much. Thank Bye. you so much. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much. Yeah, I see thank how the you. industry has so much development potentials as well. I'm so excited. I think the industry will do better in the future, as you mentioned. Absolutely. And there's huge opportunities. I, I, I think it's only yeah. positive possibilities and, and yeah. Okay, take yes. care. Bye. Thank you. Bye.